Let's get this show on the road. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for coming out on what is a, a bit of a rainy day. Uh, I was at home on this rainy day, curled up with this book, which does not have a cover. And that's because whenever you read a book, it should not have a cover, right? Because you want to preserve the cover, you take it off the book so you can dive into it. And, uh, and I enjoyed the dive. So thank you to our guest today, Evan Mandry, for uh, allowing me to enjoy that dive. Uh, we have not met before, but now we find out that we have at least uh, two, maybe three friends in common uh, from many years ago. This is, uh, it's almost, some, first I'm going to start off with a hope that I know is a vain one. This book is titled Poison Ivy, uh, and it's about higher education. Uh, so you maybe get a sense of what that is. Uh, my hope when I first opened the book was that Stanford would be excluded. From this <laughs> because we, we are not part of the Ivy League, but that was a, a vain wish because this book very much does encompass Stanford. Uh, in fact, there's no way. Uh, we can avoid, those of us here, the issues that this book raises. Uh, even saying that this event is co-sponsored by the McCoy uh, Family Center for Ethics and Society is to raise the issues that the book implicates. Uh, to say that this is uh, also co-sponsored by the Racial Justice Center uh, maybe doesn't implicate those issues because we don't have a big donor yet, uh, but we're hoping to remedy that <laughs> soon. Um, so thank you, McCoy Family Center for Ethics and Society. Thank you, Stanford Center for Racial Justice, for sponsoring this. Um, this is an enormously uh, timely uh, and important event. Uh, this is an important discussion, I'll just say, to keep it personal for all of us, because everyone who's in here uh, not only has an educational connection to an elite institution, uh, we also have connections in terms of our identities and our deepest senses of self, uh, the very way we move through the world, who we are, what we want for our children, what our parents wanted for us, the type of questions people ask us when they first meet us, the type of information we want from people when we meet them, all of that comes, uh, you know, connects uh, with the issues that Evan is addressing in this book. Uh, so these are issues that are immensely important for all of us personally, uh, and they're also important in ways that we'll get into in the discussion for the society as a whole. So that's why I'm glad you're here. This issue is also timely. I'm sorry, something not on? Usually my, usually my wife says I talk too loud. Um, so this is rare. Um, she's actually frequently said I talk too loud. But, um, this, this is also a timely issue because, as many of you no doubt know, the Supreme Court is, is currently uh, considering two cases involving uh, elite college admissions, uh, colloquially uh, referred to as a Harvard case. Uh, Students for Fair Admissions has filed a lawsuit uh, challenging the admissions processes at Harvard University and also University of North Carolina, and their requested remedy in those suits is the end of affirmative action, uh, and maybe even more, the end of any consideration of race in the context of college admissions. Uh, we should have an, a, a ruling in those cases uh, a month from now, uh, probably by the end of June. So um, the legal world is sort of waiting to hear uh, the verdict on those cases. This is from a Supreme Court who has shown no hesitancy uh, to issue bombshell rulings. So that makes this decision or, or discussion even more timely. With that, I'll turn it over uh, to Evan, and he'll give those of you who haven't yet read the book, which I encourage you to do, um, he'll give a, a brief overview of the book, then we'll have some Q&A, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, I am so grateful that uh, Stanford would have a conversation with like this. I think that kind of you know simultaneous ability to have speech about even the most challenging things is what at least on my version of America, made, makes or made this a great country. And so I'm very grateful for it. And having said that, I'll try to provoke you all as much as I possibly can. Um, so um, my engagement with this issue um, uh, began, uh, I was having dinner with a friend 10 years ago. He was an enthusiastic alumni interviewer for Harvard. I was not. I was mostly uh, disaffected when I was in college. And, uh, you know, was trying to probe our differences. And he... <clears throat> relied a lot on the Harvard Financial Aid Initiative, which um, kicked in at $65,000 at the time. And uh, I said, uh, well, that begs the question, how many students from families making less than $65,000 a year does Harvard actually admit? And that was higher than the median income at the time. 
Uh, we didn't have the benefit of the Raj Chetty, John Friedman data, so we settled our bet using um, data from the Harvard Crimson, and it was around 15%. And that kind of began a decade or so plunge down this rabbit hole for me. I uh, wrote an op-ed in the Times on legacy preference. And um, <coughs> uh, I, I know people don't always believe me on this. I, I wasn't a zealot when I started this. I was a skeptic. Um, and um, the more I researched, um, the more uh, I kind of became convinced of the case that I've laid out here. Um, so just to kind of explain briefly about me, um, I grew up uh, in Brooklyn. That's my childhood best friend. That's um, the apartment building I grew up in. That's my grandfather. That's um, Coney Island, where he used to take me on weekends. If any of you know Coney Island, that's the steeplechase. It's not there anymore. We moved when I was 12 to um, a very middle class white suburb in Long Island. And Poison Ivy is obviously a double entendre. It's about the interrelationship between elite colleges in the suburbs. I was a bowler. I take great pride in that. My dad, both of my parents were um, public educators. My dad was a high school math teacher and later principal of Brooklyn Tech, um, where he went as a student and still works. Um, he's been there seriously for 62 years, and he still works all the time. I went to Harvard. That's Derek Bach, who's a force for good. I don't have a picture of law school graduation. Um, but for the past 24 years, I've taught at John Jay, College of Criminal Justice. And for those of you who don't know the City University of New York, uh, two thirds of our students come from families making $30,000, less than $30,000 a year, um, which is you know, a pretty staggering statistic. And it's literally, that experience has just changed the way I look at opportunity in America. Um, these are some of the students that I've taught at John Jay. That's my daughter. That's the most important person there. Uh, and for nine years, um, you know, uh, I opened the book with a metaphor. We lived in a suburb, which we've moved from. Um, and nobody from that suburb, and you get the picture for where we used to live, ever goes to a college like John Jay. And nobody from John Jay comes from a place like that. Um, this is the story that elite colleges tell about themselves. This is a pretty terrible Hallmark movie, unless you're a, you want to feel better about yourself as a parent, um, because at the key scene, the pivotal scene in the movie, when Child Protective Services comes to take Liz Murray away, her father continues watching Jeopardy. So even I exceed that low bar of parenting. Um, <laughs> but this, to me, is the quintessential American dream. This is a man named Abdullah Diallo, who's been in my life for almost uh, 20 years. Um, I actually think he's the theoretical maximum of opportunity in the world. He grew up in uh, Guinea in actually a poor community, a poor rural community in Guinea. And um, through a series of miracles, he went to elementary school. He did well. He goes to the capital of Conakry. He does well. His family supports him. He's a French speaker. He comes to New York, works as a bike messenger. He teaches himself English. He, sees, he <coughs> delivers a package to John Jay. He applies. and. And believe it or not, that's him at law school graduation uh, from Fordham. And that's him and his beautiful family. Um, the only thing, the first thing I want to say about this is this isn't what elite colleges do very much of. Um, so here's a ranking of schools with the lowest percentage of students from the lowest income quintile. Uh, at Washington and Lee, only about 1% of students come from the lowest income quintile. I, did you the favor of bolding the Stanford numbers here? It's 3.5%. Um, and here are the colleges with the highest. Um, so you'll see this is the ranking of CUNY colleges. And uh, Staten Island, which is the least diverse suburb in New York, comes in lowest. And that's still quadruple of Stanford's number. Um, the Chetty and Friedman key statistic, and there are lots of ways to slice their data, and I do it some other ways. but. Um, they use mo mobility from the bottom income quintile to the top income quintile. And of the 12 highest colleges with the highest mobility rates in the country, eight are at CUNY, uh, John Jay, that's 10% of our population. And here's the mobility rates at Ivy plus colleges, which are the eight Ivies plus Stanford, MIT, University of Chicago, and Duke. Um, so you get a sense that MIT, which is the best of the worst in a lot of respects here, is still coming in below Queens College, which is the worst of the best. Um, sorry, I didn't just make this slide for today. That's the one I always use. Um, uh, and uh, I think when another way of looking at the Chetty Friedman data is how much elite colleges are in the business of keeping rich kids rich. 
Um, so here's a ranking of colleges by um, students who come from the top income quintile. That's four-fifths of people at Washington and Lee. 20% uh, of Vanderbilt students are coming from the top 1%. And um, I think the number of top 0.1 percenters at Stanford is 2.3%. Um, ballpark, it takes about $650,000 to be a top 1 percenter in the United States. And it's around 2.3, 2.4 million to be a top 0.1 percenter. Um, so uh, uh, I re-sliced the Chetty Friedman data. Um, and this is looking at people who start in the top income quintile and remain in the top income quintile. And when you sort the data this way, um, you're going to see a picture that starts to look a lot more like <coughs> the US news rankings, which are noxious for a variety of reasons. Um, Princeton, which pretty consistently comes to as um, the worst of the 12 Ivy Plus colleges in this data, um, that's about 54% of what they do. And I think there's another very important point of this story, which is uh, you know, one kind of familiar retort that people, defenders of the system, will say is, well, the Ivies are really a very small portion of kind of what's going on in American higher education, but they're disproportionately influential in terms of access to elite professions like investment banking and management consulting. Um, another way of looking at the data is, uh, which I came up with, is just people who start out in the top income quintile and are promoted to the top 1%. So this data, if you want to visualize this, is you know, what would a college, who, what would the college, uh, what, would, what would be the story you would tell at somebody's 10th reunion? So at Princeton, 20% um, of people would be people who started in the top income quintile and made it to the top 1% 10 years out. Um, this is, I'll talk about this book when we do this. I'll spare, I won't ruin your dinner with this, but this is a conversation um, in which uh, Antonin Scalia is speaking at uh, American University's law school. And he's asked by a woman named Christina Strut, uh, Strut how she's going to get a Supreme Court clerkship. And paraphrasing, he says, you're not. Um, and <laughs> this is kind of, you know, if you looked at your 10th Princeton reunion, about half of the people there would be uh, people who started off wealthy and remained wealthy. Uh, about half of those would be people who made it from the top income quintile to the top 1%. And one person would be a person who started off poor and made it into the top income quintile. And I just want to add, one of my key hypotheses is that this shapes, so the story that colleges tell is that they're kind of, they're, they're reflections of underlying inequities in society. And that's true to some extent. Uh, but I think the causal chain is reversed a lot more than we give credit to in the United States, that this shapes the way people move through the country. And I argue that the standard, you know, I, I'm much more talking about class than race, but that the standard white upper middle class life course is to live in the city until you have kids, and then you either send your kids to private schools or you move to an affluent suburb. And I mean, these are some of the most graphic image in illustrations of the deep segregation in America. This is a border between Rochester and uh, Penfield. And I, I mean, it, this, the statistics are staggering. It's one of the poorest school districts in America and one of the wealthiest. You have a phenomenon. This is Piedmont in Oakland of island school districts, of which there are some 100 in the United States, which are effectively gated communities. And because um, maybe we'll get to this, Milliken versus Bradley, which is one of the worst decisions in Supreme Court history, which basically precludes busing requiring uh, engagement of suburbs in busing, um, you know, you have gross disparities between affluent white school districts and poor minoritized districts. And um, we can pick some things, whatever interest, whatever interests you, but some of the dynamics here, what people are doing when they move is they're seeking access to opportunities and narratives that these colleges choose to value. So that's the Johns Hopkins lacrosse team. You get the picture. That's the Yale ski team. You get the picture. Um, because the only sports on TV that people watch in the United States are Division I college football and Division I basketball, they have the sense that college sports are a promoter of diversity. And that is true for Division I basketball and Division I, basket, uh, Division I football. But by the time you're talking about Division Three football, it's white. And then every other sport in the United States is overwhelmingly white. Um, I tell the story in the book of a, 
a guy who's now a state rep in Massachusetts who created a program called Harlem Lacrosse, and he doubled black representation in lacrosse in the United States from 1% to 2%. Um, and of course, these, most of these sports are financially inaccessible to most families. Most people, uh, no, I actually asked my class, none of them even knew what squash was. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, one estimate, Charlie Eaton, a sociologist, sociologist estimates that elite colleges collectively get about $20 billion a year in tax breaks, right? So if you donate to Stanford, that's tax deductible. Stanford's earnings on its endowment are tax deductible. Stanford gets preferential state tax treatment and property tax treatment, right? This is all incredibly high tax base. And, you know, I think America has a right to ask in return, what are, what are we getting? And I, I can only kind of think, maybe you have another answer, but I can only think of three things. Um, it could be high racial diversity, right? It could be, and it could be high socioeconomic diversity. And, and maybe this is controversial, I would actually think it was mitigating if they took a bunch of rich white kids in and turned them into do-gooders. But that's not what happens at all. Um, at Harvard, 60% of graduates go into either tech, finance, or management consulting. By contrast, where I teach, depending how expansively you define public service, about two-thirds of our graduates go into public service. Um, if any of you are, have a connection to New York, if you stop a police officer or a firefighter or you talk to your kid's elementary school teacher, chances are better than not that they went to CUNY. So what we have in the United States are colleges of the rich that educate our management consultants and investment bankers and colleges of the poor that educate our public servants. <coughs> I looked because uh, I knew I was going to be here. And sure enough, you actually have data. And this um, story from the Stanford survey is an important part of this. Um, I'm speaking for my friend Mitchell Stevens and I. I love the work of a sociologist at UC San Diego who's sheepishly told me she's moving to Johns Hopkins. Um, and she refutes the story that these colleges tell, which is that they're just, this is what kids want to do. Uh, and Amy Binder, I think, conclusively reflects that, and it's consistent with this data. Nobody really comes into college thinking that they want to be a management consultant. I certainly didn't know what investment banking was when I went to college, but all of these high achievers are sensitive to perceptions of status and are competitive, and so they end up competing to go into these handful of occupations. And, you know, working at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and Google, I mean, this has a very, very significant impact on American policy. And I think it's consequently correct that we talk about equitable access to these institutions because they're shaping, uh -oh, they're shaping, um, they're shaping, um, you know, what essential policy. Um, and, and then, you know, I also think it would be somewhat mitigating if the story that these colleges told was, look, we're letting in, you know, you're among the hardest working of the rich and the richest. Um, sorry, you know, we're not exactly a profit maximizer, but we're in a prestige race to be the first college to have a trillion dollar endowment. And, you know, we're using you, but that's not the story that they tell. <laughs> The story that they tell is that you're the best and the brightest. And I, I can't emphasize this enough, and I have a couple of kind of uh, sort of core emotional things that I respond to. Meritocracy is a double-edged sword. If you say that the people at Stanford deserve to be, be there, then you say the kids that I teach deserve to be where they are. And I, you know, I'm sure you'll ask me about this. I reject the notion of desert in these conversations at all. But I promise you, if you sat in a room teaching, I mean, I've taught hundreds of students who got over 1,300 on their SATs, OK? All of whom work, almost all of whom work full time, almost all of whom come from complete poverty. You would not leave that experience thinking, yep, they deserve it to be at this college of the poor, which, if we're being honest, will stigmatize their resumes for the rest of their lives. So all of the people that when I work with a student and I'm a full service mentor, you know, I do the essay, I do the law school prep, I do the LSAT prep, but I'm like, look, if, you know, I, I have a woman I love, she's at Northeastern Law School, you know, John Jay goes off your resume. And uh, I don't know if any of you read, if any of you know Emmy Nietfeld's book, Acceptance, but she had a wonderful essay in the Times about 
the stories that you're even allowed to tell about growing up poor. And you have to tell the sanitized version of it. You have to say, oh, it all worked out well. Well, it doesn't all work out well for everybody. Um, and I'll just close with this data point. Um, these are your largest endowments in the United States, you know, size of small countries. And these are the endowments at the colleges with the highest stability rates, that starting in the top income quintile and remaining there, right? All in the billions, many in the 30, 40, and 50 billion. And here are the colleges with the highest mobility rates. This is my college. We have $7 million. Ken Griffin, my classmate, just gave $300 million to Harvard. $300 million would have increased our <laughs> endowment by 300, by to, you know, I mean, the, the percentage, right, it's like 3,000%. And, 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 you know, what that would have allowed us to do, that would have paid for, we have about 10,000 students, 2,000 graduate students. It would have funded, just the 5% return on that would have funded every graduate student's tuition in perpetuity. And... I don't know if you've ever heard this, I'll see if it comes up, but Malcolm Gladwell asks the then president, oh, uh, then, the then president of Harvard whether, uh, Stanford. Uh, Stanford, Stanford, yeah, whether he could, uh, what he could do with the money, I have a feeling it's not gonna come up. And he hems and he haws. And I mean, I, I think there's a point at which this is just excessive gross hoarding. And, um, you know, Anyway, my book is, what's that? Ha <laughs> ha. Um, anyway, um, my book is, I close this book with um, a story. This is the woman who's at Northeastern Law School. And um, I, I cry every time I tell the story, I might again. And um, we were talking, she, she graduated from high school a year early. She was, she was graduating from college at 20. And I said, why don't you take a gap year? And, and she said, well, what would I do? And I said, what do you dream about when you, what do you dream about when you think about your life? And she says, I've never allowed myself to dream about my life. And um, I'm sure you're gonna ask me questions about uh, what perfect justice looks like in the world, but my book is, uh, is written in the hope that we can get closer to a world in which uh, opportunity at institutions like this is more equally available to all. So thanks again for having me and uh <laughs>